Will you take your Bibles, please, and open them to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. We'll pick it up where we left off last time, beginning at verse 10. Chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 10. There are notes in your bulletin. We invite you to follow along with us in the study of God's Word. Galatians, chapter 3, verse 10. For as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hang, hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man annulleth or addeth to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot annul, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Father, we thank you for the word that has been read, and we recognize that the power of God lies reticent in its very words and letters. We remember that Jesus said, Not one jot or one tittle shall pass away till all these things be fulfilled. We thank you for the written word of God that you say is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God would be equipped for every good work. And we would ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and teach us again about the doctrinal matters of the gospel, that we would really understand it and in turn share it with others, that every man, every man to whom we witness may know that the gospel is by faith alone. And we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been studying, beginning with chapter 3, the doctrine of the true gospel after we've seen in the first two chapters how the Apostle Paul defended that true gospel. Remember again that there are three errors that are being dealt with in Galatians, the first of which is pure legalism, by which a man thinks that he can become righteous by the works of the law. There is also the error of, of liberty or false liberty by which a man believes because he is saved by grace through faith that therefore he has the right to sin as much as he wants to. Paul condemns this as false liberty, not really understanding the true gospel of grace. There is a third error called Galatianism, just a coined word, by which Christians, believers, come to believe that they, in their growth in the Lord, in their progress, in sanctification, they believe that the method and the means are the works of the law, and that is just as much an error as pure legalism. We grow in Christ by faith just as much as we are saved by faith. 
Now, in chapter 3, we are looking, first of all, the doctrine of the true gospel in relation to the person of the Holy Spirit, and he has demonstrated that the receiving of the Spirit and becoming mature in the Spirit is all by faith. And then he demonstrated this through the promise that was given to Abraham. And we showed you last week how that was literally fulfilled, that the gospel which was preached before, when God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations of the world be blessed, that that was literally true, that every nation, tribe, and people who have ever lived have somehow been born or married into that line. And we gave you some notable examples out of the Old Testament. But it is also true on the principle of faith, because the son of Abraham, Jesus Christ, is a Jew. And being married to that Jew by faith in Christ, we participate by rightful Jewish law in the inheritance that God promised through Abraham. We are now coming, at verse 10, to the problem of the curse. The problem of the curse. And there are a number of items that we want to look at. First of all, our relationship to Christ is clearly pointed out in verses 10 to to 13, our relationship to Jesus Christ. Now, if you'll notice in your Bible, in fact, it's a good way to underline, if you'll notice in verse 10, you'll see the phrase, under the curse. Just underline that, under the curse. Then if you look down in verse 13, you see Christ has redeemed us from the curse. First under the curse, now from the curse. And then you'll notice in the same verse that he was made a curse for us. And there you have a neat three-point outline of what he's talking about. Now, first of all, the word curse is simply the word condemnation. And so the first statement, dealing with our standing and making it clear to all men that we are under the curse, under the condemnation. James 2.10 says that whoever is offended in one point of the law is guilty of all of it. And the law brings men under condemnation because of what it demands. Now the second thing I want you to notice is the sacrifice of Christ that's expressed by the phrase, he hath redeemed us from or literally out of the curse. Now we mentioned this morning in our study of Romans that we would give you a little more in-depth look at the word redemption. So here it is. There are three primary words that are used in the New Testament, all teaching the concept of redemption. The first of which is the word agarazzo. Now, we've spelled these out into English for two reasons. Number one, that you might know there is a difference in the words translated redeem. But number two, if you have a concordance, and I trust you're using one in your Bible study, the words in the Greek and Hebrew, even though you don't know them, are listed and spelled into English in the back of those concordances. Many people don't know how to use a concordance, and it's very valuable to that Bible study. In the back of your concordance, especially if you use a volume like Young's, I'm referring to a total volume, you will find these words listed. Therefore, you can look them up for yourself and study the passages where they are found, and it will be an immense help to you in studying your Bible as you trace the words and their usage and thus gain more insight to them. Now, the word agarazzo comes from the simple word agora. If you have ever visited in the lands of the Bible or in Greece today, you will discover that little word agora is located at the marketplace. For an example, in the city of Athens today, at the foot of the Parthenon, if you're standing on Mars Hill, if you look just to your north, you'll see a a level spot, a square-like place that's quite large, and there's some old ruins there. And it's called the Agora. It's a marketplace. There was one in every town. You have a beautiful example of the Agora in the city of Corinth today. And so you can go and visit these places. They were really like shopping centers, like going out to Los Cerritos or Lakewood Shopping Center. It was the marketplace where a lot of business was going on. Now, from this word, there is a word translated redeemed in the Bible, agorizo or agorazzo. And it simply means to buy in the marketplace. Now, the common word for buying in the New Testament is this word, an example of which uh, uh, he went and bought and sold. It's a simple word, agarazzo. It just means to buy, to go into that marketplace and buy. Now, what does it mean when it's referring to redeemed? I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, to notice a usage of this word to help us in our understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
verse 20. Paul is emphasizing here the importance of the body being under the control of God and that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the reason for all of this is that you are no longer your own. That is, that you're not in full control of your body because you have a new resident. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your body. Now, how did this occur? It occurred because of a purchase that was made. Actually, you were bought by Jesus Christ. And we read in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 6, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The word bought is the same word redeemed. And the idea is simply that of purchasing something. Now, you can purchase any item. In the case of slaves in the time of our Lord, it's referring to just purchasing a slave. He's still a slave, but you bought him. Now he's yours. That is the idea of redeemed. We are slaves in the slave market of sin, and Christ comes in and buys us. This word carries the idea that we are still a slave, now a slave to Christ. You'll also find a usage of this in Revelation 5, 9. For those of you who like to look it up later, he hath redeemed us with his blood, says that verse. Now the second word, as you can readily see by just looking up on the chart, just has the word ex in front of it, which is a Greek preposition, ek, meaning out of. So here's an additional thought, that we are bought out of the marketplace. And that's very important because you see the first word would refer to a slave being bought, but also still being a slave. The second word means that you are bought out of the marketplace. You won't be put back into it again. And that's also true in the case of the redemption of Christ, what he's done with us. He not only bought you from being a slave to sin and yourself, and bought you to be a slave to himself, but he also bought you out from the slave market of sin, and you'll never be put back into that. I think that's glorious news. Aren't you glad of that? You will never be put back into the slave market of sin again if you've been bought by Jesus Christ. An example of the usage of this, you'll find in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 13, right in our text. It says that Christ hath redeemed us out of the curse, and that's the second word for redeem, ex agarazzo. Now, the last word, lutrao, means to set free, and it is also translated redeem. Now, what is the difference here? In the first case, you buy a slave to be a slave. In the second case, you buy him out of the slave market, never to be put back as a slave. In the third case, you pay the total ransom price for a slave to set him free and he will no longer be a slave again, a slave to no one. Perhaps you loved a slave in the marketplace so much you you became attached to him, and you eventually gave him his freedom so that he is now a Roman citizen with every right. Maybe you would adopt him as son, which was a definite legal transaction Romans did in those times. And by the way, the Bible uses that of our own relationship to Christ, that Christ has adopted us. He's made us a son. Therefore, we are heirs. We receive an inheritance. So the third word is a wonderful word, and you'll find it in a precious passage in 1 Peter 1. If you'd like to turn there, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. And all three of these words are translated redeemed in the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, where it speaks of Christ redeeming us, but remember again, keep in your mind that the word is lutrao, meaning to set free, totally. You'll no longer be a slave again. You're now a son with all the rights of inheritance. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, that's our word, with corruptible things like silver and gold, that was necessary in order to set free a slave. From your vain manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Here we learn that the price that is paid to set men free is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now back to Galatians 3, please. So referring to our relationship to Christ, three things all dealing with that word curse. First, that we're under the curse that refers to our standing and position. We offend in one point, we're guilty of all. All men are under condemnation. The second is Christ's sacrifice, that he has 
redeemed us out of that condemnation. And it's a complete deliverance. In the third case, we are talking about Christ's substitution in verse 13 when we read that he was made a curse for us. Now the word means, the little word made is becoming. He actually became that condemnation. Now Christ did not have any sin in himself, therefore he was not under condemnation, but he became under it. Here's an example of the word become, which is translated made here. In John 1, 14, the Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, the word is the same. It would be translated properly, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, Christ was not born naturally, but supernaturally by virgin birth. And he actually was God becoming flesh. It's a very important word. He was not literally made flesh like we are made flesh. He became flesh. God inhabited a human body. God was manifest in the flesh. And so in the case of this, we have the same kind of an idea. Christ was not under condemnation. He had no sin. But he became condemnation for us. All of the condemnation, which basically is dealing with death, both physical, spiritual, and eternal, the law demands that we die. That condemnation, that you must die because you're a sinner, Christ became that for the whole world. And I like the little word for here. It's in the behalf of us. He loved us and he substituted his life for us. And he became all the condemnation that we rightfully deserve. Now that deals with our relationship to Christ. In verse 14, we have the results of all of this, and he's concluding the section dealing with the person of the Holy Spirit under the doctrine of the true gospel. And he tells us about the wonderful results, and they're twofold. And very clear, very simple for you to see. Verse 14. First, is that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. All that he said is in order that this wonderful blessing that God gave to Abraham, all of the wonderful promises of God, his inheritance, everything promised to that man and his seed. Now that can come on the Gentiles because of what Christ has done. That's the point. And secondly, another in order that, verse 14 says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The word receive is again in that aorist tense we spoke about earlier, meaning a point of time. You receive the Spirit in a point of time. When is that time? It's when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, as we have already seen from verse number 2. So his conclusion is that all men, whether Jew or Gentile, are recipients of the promise to Abraham, and all men are recipients of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for that. There's no select super spiritual group that has the Holy Spirit. But all believers have the Holy Spirit by way of present possession. Now, beginning with verse 15, he begins a second area of discussion which flows out of the first. The first, dealing with the doctrine of the true gospel, affected the person of the Holy Spirit, how you receive him, and the promise that would be given to all men through faith. Now, from that, and in the midst of that, we discuss the promise to Abraham. Now he comes back to it and hits it very strongly. There are several things we'd like you to see about this promise to Abraham, beginning at verse 15. The first of which is its relationship to the law. Now, as you know, those of you who have been studying Romans with us, as well as Galatians, we've been clubbing over the head quite strongly about people who follow the law in order to be saved or in order to grow in Christ. But the question is, what is the purpose of the law? What is the relationship of the law to the promise? And Paul clarifies that. According to verse 15, he says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. In other words, just giving you what's common knowledge among all men. Regarding covenants. Though it be but a man's covenant. Now, of course, this one is not a man's covenant. But the point is by way of an illustration. Speaking after the manner of men. As human beings know, a man's covenant, if it be confirmed, no man can annul it or add to it. 
contract. You might translate will. Unless you change that will. If you've made that will, no man can annul it or add to it unless there's something legally wrong with it. If it's legally correct, you can't do anything about it. That's in terms of men's contracts and covenants. And that's the illustration. Because he tells us in verses 15 to 17 the extent to which a covenant is confirmed. Now that covenant that was given to Abraham, that promise which is found in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, also repeated in other chapters, that covenant was unconditional. No conditions attached to it. And that covenant, which was a contract by God, nothing can change. Now, I'd like to digress for a moment to talk to you about dispensationalism. Now, that may seem to be a big digression, but it's important at this point. What is dispensationalism? If you would attend the Institute of Biblical Studies here in the church, you would receive a course in dispensations and covenants. You would understand what they are talking about. Basically, when men talk of dispensations, they speak of them as a period of time which God is managing affairs after certain principles. Now, the whole idea of dispensations comes out of really one verse, of which there are many other verses that add to it and illuminate it, but one verse, and that's in Ephesians 1.10. If you'll turn there, please. Now, this is a digression, but it's necessary. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. So you won't find it on your notes if you're taking them on the ones that were given you in the bulletin, so find some space elsewhere to take down this. Ephesians 1 verse 10. In summarizing God's wonderful program for us and redeeming us and bringing us to himself, he gives us a broader view than simply our salvation. God's final plan, friends, is not simply to save us. God's final plan will come back to himself by way of ultimate goal. In verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, there's certain things we know about this verse. Number one, this is the English word dispensation from which a teaching has arisen called dispensationalism. Now, one thing that is true about this verse is we know there is a coming dispensation in which God will gather all things together under Jesus Christ. I believe that's referring to the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, in which he'll be king of kings and lord of lords over everything, and everything will be gathered together under him. Well, one thing that's obvious from this verse is there must be at least one other dispensation, at least the one in which he's writing. He's saying there's a coming one, and obviously there must have been something that went on before, because he said in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, the word times is referring to seasons various times of history in which God has worked. Now, what does the word dispensation mean? We get our word economy from this word straight from the Greek. It refers really to stewardship or the managing of a household. It has two words. One, the law is in that word, and also the house, called the law of the house. It came to mean stewardship. For instance, a master of his household might entrust to his servant a stewardship of his possessions while he was gone. That's the word for dispensation. In other words, God is managing things according to a certain fixed pattern of principles in a certain dispensation. In the coming one that he's talking about in Ephesians 1.10, he will gather together all things under Christ. Things will be different than they are now, in other words. Now, how many dispensations are there? Men have argued that there are seven. I don't know how many there are, to be truthful. There may be 103, for all I know. Men have argued that there are seven, but there are at least two from Ephesians 1.10, perhaps more. But according to the Apostle Paul, dispensationalism really is divided into two categories, and the cross separates it all. The whole issue of law and grace is all built around the cross of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul is attempting to show here in Galatians that what God said to Abraham has never changed. And there is a faulty teaching in dispensationalism which says that each period of time in which God was working, he had to work according to these methods, 
and that these methods were different and, and were affecting the methods that he had previously, an example of which. We have the dispensation of promise, referring to when God promised something to Abraham. Then they say there's a dispensation of law, dispensation of grace, human government, innocence, conscience. It's all developed for you in the Schofield Bible in case you like to look at it. But friends, there isn't any dispensation, any economy that has ever affected the promise to Abraham. There's one faulty thinking among dispensationalists, and that is that they don't see the centrality and the importance of God's promise to Abraham. Did you know that the whole gospel is built on it? Abraham stands as a key to God's program. His promise is extremely important. We are recipients of eternal life and forgiveness and salvation because of the promise to Abraham. Now, never forget that. And Paul's argument here, bringing us back here to Galatians 3, is simply showing us that that promise was just as much a contract, unconditional, that is, there are no conditions upon man's response. Some people say that promise is only good if man responds in a good manner. That's not true. This is unconditional. God will perform his contract just like the will that you legally made and was correct and everything was all right about it. No one can change that or add to it unless you do it. And that's the point. God had a contract, and the law cannot possibly affect his contract. You see, people, we are always saved by faith. It's an everlasting gospel, and the law came for a direct purpose. But men were never saved by the law. And this passage will tell us why the law was given. And the law cannot affect the unconditional promise that he gave to Abraham. That's the point. If you look back at Galatians 3 and verse 16 and 17, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and the seeds, in other words, God's program doesn't start with Abraham and then spread out to many nations. As we showed you last time, he's bringing all those nations back into one line. Because the point of the promise is to a seed, meaning Christ himself, according to verse 16. Verse 17 adds, And this I say, that the covenant, the contract, that was confirmed before by God, and what's the next phrase? What does it say aloud? In Christ. Now the covenant was before what? Before the law. But notice he says the covenant was confirmed in who? In Abraham? in Christ. Now here we learn an amazing truth that God's program always included the promise to Abraham. Always. It was not something God brought on the scene when Abraham was there. He'd always intended to do this. And God's program was always in Christ. And then he goes on to say, verse 17, that the law, which was 430 years after, cannot annul or render inoperative or make of no effect that it should make the promise of no effect. The law cannot change the promise. And you see, that's what the Jews were confusing. Because in addition to circumcision, the law was another tenet, quote, of the faith. And they misunderstood God's promise, which is always by faith, that was given to Abraham. And Abraham, as we learned Genesis 15, 6, believed God and it was put to his account for righteousness. So the law cannot have changed that. So we learn the extent to which a covenant is confirmed, and the point is simple. You cannot change it. No one could ever be saved by law, but only by faith. Now the second thing we want you to see in the promise's relationship to the law is the effect of the law according to the end of verse 17. It cannot annul or make ineffective. Now why can't it? In this statement of verse 17, you have the words confirmed before by God. In the Greek, it's a perfect tense, which means having been confirmed. It means it was confirmed in the past when he gave it to Abraham, and it has present finished results. It is still confirmed and still just as valid today as it was before. Therefore, because of that, the law has no effect. The third thing that we want you to see is an explanation as to why all this is important. Verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. All the inheritance that God has for every one of us. 
But God gave it to Abraham by promise. The point here is kind of like uh, putting the burden of proof back on you if you think the law is important in terms of what he's talking about. He's saying, well, now, if you believe that all your inheritance is by law keeping, let me remind you that God gave it by promise. He didn't give it by law. So therefore, I guess you're not a recipient of the inheritance, you see. That's the point of it. He's explaining that all that God wants to give you is in the seed, Christ, and it's in faith alone in him that procures it for yourself, not any way else. No other way will do. Now, the second thing we want you to see in this passage is very important to the law, and that's the reason for it. What is the reason for the law? Verses 19 to 29 tell us. And there are two things here that Paul is unfolding, one of which is to show us the nature of man's sin. That is why the law was given. Verse 19, wherefore then, you notice the little word serveth is in italics, means it's not in the original text. So it simply is wherefore then the law. What's the point of the law? Why even have one is the point of that verse. The answer, it was added because of transgressions, sins. The law showed men the nature, the real nature of their sin. Did you know that sin is basically the transgression of the law? God gave man that law to prove to him what was already true. According to Romans 5, death reigned from Adam to Moses. At the time of Moses, the law was given. So even before the law came, men still died. They were still sinners. The law came and showed man very clearly, without any question, that he had disobeyed God in every way. God's perfect moral standard is still the law, and the law shows men the nature of their sin. It's a violation of God's perfect righteousness and his morality. Whenever we sin, we are violating something that God is in himself. Let me give you an example. The Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me or beyond me. And that's what it means, period. Whenever you sin in that regard, you are violating something that God is in himself, and that is preeminent over everything. And that's true of every one of the Ten Commandments. You are violating something that God is in his perfect, moral, righteous character. And God gave the law to show man clearly, in written form, why he was a sinner and why he was dying, why he deserved condemnation. The law painted it out very clearly. So Galatians 3 tells us that it came to show us. Now, notice, first of all, the means by which it was given. Chapter 3, according to these verses, in verses 19 to 20, it was imparted, first of all, by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, if you're a good Bible student, be sure to look at verse 19 and 20 carefully because the mediator here is not Christ. The mediator is Moses. That's the means by which it was given, ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The angels accompanied were in attendance, participated in the giving of the law, and it came to the hands of a mediator. Now, watch this point carefully. Now, a mediator, verse 20, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. What's the point of all that? Well, Moses, you see, was mediating between two, receiving the law from God, given to him by angelic beings, according to this text, and he mediated it for the people, gave the law then to the people. He was a go-between, a mediator between the two. But the Bible says that God isn't mediating between two. He's one. What's the point of that? I hope you got it. It's a beautiful thing. And that is there was no need of mediation. God's handled the whole thing in and of himself. Completely, totally. All he asks us to do is believe. This sounds like Romans again, I know, but it's the same thing. And that really thrilled me. God's one. He's not mediating between anybody else. He's it. And he's done the whole thing. He just asks you to believe it. Will you believe it? You see, the promise is very much different than the law. The law was given to Moses and he mediated between two, showing God's holiness and showing men what they were like. But God isn't mediating between someone higher than himself and us. He's the whole ball of wax. And he asks us to believe what he's done. And that's a tremendous point in that text. Now notice the motive that is mentioned in verse 21 and 22. 
Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, or let it not ever be. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You know one thing, the law, you know what the motive was behind the law? To get everybody in the place where they're going to run to Jesus. <laughs> That's the whole thing here. The law wants to get all of us so that we'll just run, I mean pale mail to Jesus. That we'll never again think that we could ever be righteous before God or that our good deeds would let us into heaven. The law was given to drive men to Christ. That's the motive behind it. Make you run there. If you still are trusting yourself, then you better go back and study the law in detail. And you'll discover that all of us are condemned because if we offend in one point again, we're guilty of the whole thing. Now then also notice the method that the law used. This is kind of interesting. Verse 23. Before faith came, you say, wasn't there always faith? Yes. What's he talking about? In the finished work of Christ, the promised seed. We were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. This is beautiful to me. You know, the law had a kind of an indirect motive there upon all of us. It kept us like with chains on us. Now, it was awful to be under the bondage of that. But you see, God had a very delightful motive in all that too. He kept you under bondage so you been run, wouldn't run around and kill yourself. You wouldn't get off on the wrong track. You wouldn't do something that wasn't what he wanted. The law kept men all bound up and kept them under for one reason. So you would see what Christ did at the cross and it would show men that the promise of God is by faith alone. The law actually kept men under until that time. Now let's look at the second reason why the law, the reason for the law. And that's in verses 24 to 29. And that is to show us the nature of Christ's sacrifice. To show us the nature of Christ's sacrifice. Two things I want you to see here. In verses 24 to 25, he tells us the purpose that was involved. Look at it carefully. Wherefore, whenever you find the word wherefore, you know what to do. Find out what it's wherefore. Uh, therefore. Whenever you see those little words, then, therefore, wherefore, you understand that that's a point in writing that is depending upon all the context that has gone before it. Wherefore, Paul says, in the basis of what I just told you, the law was our schoolmaster. Now, before you think of the principal of our high school as being the schoolmaster, you better stop for a moment. The schoolmaster was really a word meaning disciplinarian. Now, we hope our principals are disciplinarians. But the idea of the schoolmaster disciplined his pupils, and that was the way he kept them under. You see? It's a beautiful thing. The law was a schoolmaster. Now, this is crude, but suppose there's a whip in the hand of the schoolmaster. The schoolmaster is the law. And he's whipping his pupils, keeping them down, keeping them under. What for? Well, according to this, to bring us unto Christ. It's just like a fellow who's been whipped so long by the schoolmaster and discipline one day learns that there's no more need for the schoolmaster. I mean, that's a great day. I mean, he's shouting glory. The schoolmaster led him to Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. Why? Verse 24 tells you that we would be justified by faith. Faith alone. And that law continued to discipline people. It'll still do the same thing today. I feel sorry if you're still under that bondage. The law was intended to bring you to Jesus Christ and show you that he paid for all the righteous demands of the law, which is what we discussed this morning. Verse 25, after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, if you will get the picture again, the, the man who owns the school, who had a schoolmaster disciplining us for a while, is the one now who no longer asks you to be a pupil under a schoolmaster, but has brought you up on a level with him in the corporation, and he's now telling you that you are a joint heir. You now have everything that he promised and everything that he has in himself and Christ has the whole universe as his inheritance, and God says now through faith, only faith, believing what I've told you, you become a joint heir. 
Not through law, but through faith. You know what the word inheritance means? It's a real neat play in the situation here. Inheritance, if you break down the word, is the law of the lot. You know, when we uh, cast lots to determine something. The law of the lot determined what the inheritance was, you see, and that's the way they use the word. Well, according to the Bible, we are joint heirs with Christ. You know how they divided up the promised land, gave certain lots to various tribes? You remember when Joshua came into the land? Well, guess what? The lot we drew was the whole universe. Everything. We own it. How? By faith. We don't deserve it, but we own it. You know, I own Mars out there. You know, it's mine, all of it, totally. Those guys think they're getting to the moon, and I own that too. I own everything. I own the trees, especially the good ones. Everything. I own it all. And you know, sometimes we get so down that we don't uh, remember the inheritance we have. You know, you can wade through this stuff and say, hey, you know, I've heard that and I understand that and so forth. But you know, what do we do with this truth? You know, how does it affect us? If there was ever anything that would get you up, it will be the doctrine of the Word of God. Don't live in the valley in depression and discouragement when you own everything. Just walk out tonight and look under the stars. I think it's pretty clear, unless it got cloudy while we're in here. And just look at all the stars and say, hey, hallelujah, I own it all. It's all mine. Because I'm a joint heir with Christ. And realize that that's what Paul is talking about through this whole passage. We're getting an inheritance because we're sons of God by faith and we're all in the line of Abraham, something God promised to Abraham. And that tells us a little bit about our position, verses 26 to 29. It's simply this, that we're all sons. Now, when you redeem a slave, he's a slave. When you pay the price, that third word we saw tonight, you set him free and he can be adopted as a son. A son receives the inheritance. You ever wondered, anybody ever ask you, well, if Jesus, you know, was virgin born and was really God manifest in the flesh, then how come the Bible says he's the son of God? Anybody ever ask you that? Let me see your hand. Anybody ever ask you that question? Man, I get that question a lot of times. How come if Jesus wasn't born naturally, is he called the son of God? Well, the answer is quite simple. If you understand just a little bit of Greek, you know, can throw it on somebody here. One is that the word meaning born one is never used of Jesus Christ. Not once. Little word technos. Never used of Jesus Christ. He wasn't born a natural way like you and I. Well, the word son that is used is the same one here. Quios. And it's referring to a son by way of position. It basically referred to the one who would receive the inheritance. Isn't that a neat thing? Jesus was the son of God, meaning the one who would receive the inheritance. It refers to position, the unique. You know when it says the only begotten son? Somebody shoot that back. Now, wait a minute. If he's begotten, then, you know, you're back where you start again. No, you're not. Because over in Hebrews, it refers to Abraham's son, Isaac, as his only begotten son. Now, just a minute. Abraham had a lot of other children. He had Ishmael. He had many sons by another wife, Keturah. He had many sons. And the Bible says Isaac was his only begotten son. You see, the little word only begotten is not referring again to natural birth. It's referring to position. Isaac was by way of position. The unique son would be an excellent translation. Jesus is God's unique son. Son meaning receiving all of the inheritance. And guess what happens to you the moment you believe in God and believe in Christ? You become a son also and joint heirs with Christ. I think that's pretty neat. Verse 27, just giving the argument as to why as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's a beautiful illustration. You watch those people baptized tonight, went down into the water. Now, when they were down into the water, they literally put on water. Did you notice? I mean, the water was all over. And that's all that's saying here. You see, that's emblematic of being baptized into Christ. You put on Christ. I mean, you're just surrounded, engulfed by Jesus. As a result, verse 28 says, there's no distinctions anymore. No Jews, no Greeks, no bonds, no free, no male, no female. All are one in Christ, in him, in the seed. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Don't be ashamed, you're a Jew. You are. You are a Jew. You are Abraham's seed. 
And you are a son of God and you have all the inheritance. You know, the Bible says in Genesis 12, 3, that God would bless them that blessed Abraham and cursed them that curse you. Now, you're in a unique role now. You are a real Jew. Anybody who curses you is asking for trouble. Anybody who blesses you is going to get blessing. A real Jew. Why? Because you are in Christ, and Christ is the seed. And we have a wonderful position. We ought to thank God for it.